Hi, welcome to Divorce TV. Uh, I'm your host, Wally Marcus, and our topic today is Divorce FAQ, or Divorce Frequently Asked Questions. My very special guest is my good friend, Rita Pollack, who is our second time on the show, and as I said earlier, Rita and I had a lot of time, last time talking about uh, food. We're not going to talk about too much about food today, um, but it's a pleasure to have you, Rita, and we're going to, before I do that, just let me remind everybody that if you, uh, if you have any more information, more information about the show, a little tongue-tied, you want to be a guest, you have some questions or suggestions, you can always email us, which will show up on the screen periodically, or you can also uh, check out our website. Rita, once again, welcome. Uh, pleasure to have you on the show for the second Thank time. You. And I think the last time you weren't in Tucson full-time, now you're a full-time Tucson native, so 60 degrees seems cold to you or didn't didn't before. Uh, right. And it's always it's always fun talking, you know, when we get together, the four of us, and that talking about divorce and sharing war stories, uh, a little bit more sharing those things with everybody else today, but... For those of the people that did not see the show last time, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a divorce attorney. I've been a divorce attorney for more than 30 years. The first 20 years, I was a litigator and represented clients going to court, getting divorced. And then I learned about collaborative law, and I became a collaborative attorney for the last 10 years of my career. And that meant I helped people get divorced without going to court, helping them seek resolution of their issues without having to go to court and without having to damage each other. And I've also been a mediator for 25 years. And I love telling stories with you because we do the same work and I think we approach it pretty much from the same way. I think we do have a a similar style. I want to caution people watching the show, though, that this is not a substitute for getting legal advice from an attorney or a person you're dealing with. This is a, we're sort of dealing in generalities. Every case is very very specific and different, and you really can't do that. But we're sort of talking a little bit about uh, some of the, the problems we have and the thing, questions we hear. And a lot of the topics, if you want people want more information about them, they can go to our YouTube site where we've talked in more detail about some of these things. Um, I'm sure, like you, I have, you've gotten numerous questions over the years. And I think one of the th- interesting things about this is that the same questions are asked sometimes over and over again. So I think that's sort of an interesting thing. But what do you think people want to you know, people thinking about a divorce, what do they do? I think when people realize that either they're going to get a divorce or they're going to be divorced, their partner is going to leave them and file for divorce, they panic and they don't know what to do. And either they go to the internet these days and they fill themselves up with information from all different sites and they get little snippets of information and they don't even really know the language, they don't even know the questions to ask. Caution people, that is, I find that very dangerous when people go on the internet and they come back and with uh, sort of uh... with little pieces of information that don't hang together, and I think the rest of what people do is what they know about divorce is kind of the traditional divorce: going to court, getting an attorney, duking it out, and they may not know that there are other options. And so, what are some of those other options of getting information about divorce? And, and what are, well, we'll go into a little bit later some of the right. options. Right. What, what other ways they can get information that can't doesn't work with the internet? Well, other than the internet. Well, I think they really should try to seek out the advice of a, a good, specialized family attorney. It doesn't mean they have to hire that person, and it doesn't mean they have to have a traditional representation. But that's the person who's really most experienced about the culture and the community and what goes on locally um, and what the judges expect and what the options are locally for them. Is there so, a charge for that normally, do you think, or? Well, I used to charge. You know, when people came to me for a consultation, I used to charge because I felt like they were walking away with a lot of information. I didn't give them vague, generalized answers. I gave them information. I gave them packets of material. I gave them resources. I sent them off to places where they could get more information. So I charged. A lot of people don't, or they'll charge just a little uh, bit. We we do a free half-hour consultation when we do it, Yeah. which sometimes is a little bit longer than that, but... It's often longer than that because people have so many questions, and they should have questions. This is an important event in their life. It doesn't matter if they're choosing it or if it's being foisted on them. Yeah, this is something the, important. When you, when you said that, I always, always think of the conflicting situations because if somebody does talk to an attorney then and they give them that information, then their spouse can't use that attorney. And uh, there were people when we were... I've practiced over the years. I know they would go to all the top attorneys right. so that they could talk to them, not because they were looking for advice, but because they wanted to make sure their spouse didn't right. hire the person. Right. They'd and knock them out of the box. An attorney I knew later, once upon, in, 
actually billing somebody twenty thousand dollars for that initial consultation because what? he said that was the money he lost. I know. Oh, what? That's that's pretty. This, this was this was uh, Fairfield County in Connecticut. It was a, yeah. a different sort of practice, but he actually did that. Wow. I don't know if he collected it or not, but wow. Um, I kind of hope not. <laughs> you know, I, I saw some of his bills over the years too. So there's that's pretty outrageous. Another story. Well, he would they would talk about the case every single day, and that's what people have to watch. But and they would each bill at five hundred dollars an hour, and would bill a client a thousand dollars every day for discussing the case. Oh, I know. Come on. That's. I saw I'm the sorry to hear that because you know you you know this from your practice and I know this from my practice. Most family law attorneys are very conscientious and very careful. So you've got a few bad actors in there, but I don't want the audience to think that that they should be worried when they go talk to an attorney. They but, should do that consultation and trust what they hear. Yeah, but well, I don't think they should try to conflict people <laughs> out either. But I think I would. I think the thrust of that is you got to really have your attorneys accountable and know what they're doing and just right. not you know give a blank check. Oh, no, you shouldn't give anyone a blank check. But we did talk about the fact that there are different ways to get divorced. There's a traditional way of going to court. I mentioned collaborative law. I know you do mediation. And so that is one of the frequently asked questions that we get either on the phone or when people come in. What are the different options? And maybe you could explain some of those. Yeah, I always, when I explain, I usually do it from the bottom up, least expensive to most expensive. And I tell people, and a lot of people represent themselves, whether pro, pro se, pro perk. Here in, in Arizona, in, in, in California, here, in, and in here in Arizona, um, and they can do that. And there are a lot of kids. And, and strange, interestingly enough, over fifty percent of the divorces, I think, in most jurisdictions, are now people representing themselves. Right. I always think that's. It depends on it's the risky. on the case. If you're no kids and there's no proper minimal property and there's issues, you can do it. There, you can do that. Uh, uh, I, sometimes I said it's a little bit dangerous, like you know, doing brain surgery on yourself. It's uh, a little risky, but I think it, let's hear I what, do that. Yeah. what that what that conversation would be if someone came and asked you what the options are, and you started from the I'd bottom. Let's start up. with that one, and I I would say that you could represent yourselves, you know, and do that, and this is the way it is, and there's the kits, and there's the books, and there's a lot of things out there, and you can do it yourself. Um, and even at that point, I advise people you still may want to have a professional person look at it just as a consultation, not necessarily representing you. But that's to me was the least expensive. Want right. to do that, and sometimes the next one up I found were very often couples who could knew what they sort of wanted, but didn't want to take the time to write it up themselves. Didn't right. feel confident doing that, and it, it can be a minefield. And so, what I would sometimes recommend to that person is you have one attorney representing one of them, right. other person representing themselves. But I always said to the person who was not represented that you should really go to have somebody consulted before you sign that one. And the attorney writes it up, and there's not a lot of negotiations, and you right. get a a professional way of doing it. I think that for me, the next step up after that was, um, and you, you and I do, right. you have more emphasis on collaborative and I do more emphasis on mediation, but I always thought the mediation was sort of the next next step up of that one, which tended to be, I always found a very efficient, cost-effective way of doing things. It right. was a mediator, and you can watch our, our YouTube on, on mediation, but you know, essentially a neutral person representing not representing either person, but being right. a facilitator if they're doing facilitated mediation. And once again, I recommended to people, although not required, that they have somebody review an attorney review right. it and doing that. And I always felt that you know if the attorneys can be expensive if they're making a lot of phone calls and doing depositions, but you can really if you use a, uh, a scalpel instead of a meat axe on this approach, you you know right. you're getting the the essence of what the attorney knows without costing right. you a, a, you know an arm right. and a leg. On that one, next step up, I think, is collaborative in my mind. Uh, right. And it, once again, it depends on, on, and the results I think are, can be very much the same with any pro- good professional involved. But collaborative, um, usually there's a little bit more issues involved sometimes, not always on that one. And the next step up, collaborative attorney, you know, with the, the, the approach with all the professionals and everybody else working on it. And we've done, you did the show on collaborative right. a while back and do that. Um, but I think that's the next step up, and there are a lot of people doing collaborative, and a lot of good people doing all these things. Yes. Um, but I think people have to always make sure that the person's capable of doing all that one. Last step up is uh, the knockout, drag out right. adversary. It doesn't have to be that way if you're dealing with good people, but uh, I very this, often always think of, uh, you know, I probably won't. Right. <laughs> I was thinking of the line right. from The Godfather, but I no, won't repeat no. it. No, no, but it is, it's clearly the most costly. I think the thing for me, the essence for me, is that that people... Uh, we hope will understand that they're coming into foreign territory. And I'm not sure if I would use the same analogy of the scalpel and the meat axe, but I would certainly say that they're coming into a place where there's a different language and where the meaning of the words are very important. So it's really important for them to have an attorney look over something before they sign it. And I tell clients when they call, you would never conclude any other kind of legal transaction 
without having an attorney look it over. And you're setting yourself up and your family up for the future when you sign your divorce agreement. So at the very least, even if you're doing it yourself, I think they should have attorneys look it over if they're going to do kind of the kitchen table negotiations and have one attorney write it up, then the, the other person certainly should have someone look it over and before the, they sign it. So I'm really echoing what you're saying. But the question, I'm going to ask you the question that I hear all the time is, can one attorney represent both of us? And the answer is no. I mean, it's ethically not permissible to really represent someone. You can only give one person advice. So the other person's unrepresented. And I think that's why they should, at the very least, take that document to someone who will look at it through their eyes and for their benefit and give them advice about it. And the document may be just great. And, and that attorney may say, go ahead and sign it. But it really gives you peace of mind. And I think it's the responsible thing to do. Yeah. And I, as I said, I always encourage people to, to, to do that as well. Yeah. in this situation. So, I think uh, we also get questions about what is this paperwork all about? <laughs> why do we have to fill out financial forms? And why do we have to fill out affidavits? And why do we have to fill out petitions? And this is a paper-driven transaction. A, we, I've had clients who said that, you know, that, right. that when they see the paperwork, they say, oh, I think I'd rather stay married. <laughs> I, I've heard that too. I've heard that too. People say, I don't want to have to go through all this. But you are dividing things up. You have to give current information, and then a record of it does have to be at the court, and the record has to be accurate. So whether it's in the separation agreement or the financial statements that are attached to that, you have to do the paperwork. And as much as you might not like it, that's what it's all about, another, getting accurate information. Another question that I get a lot of times is, uh, do I have to disclose all my assets? Yes, you do. <laughs> you have to do everything on the above board. We get that question all the time. You know, uh, what do I do with my money? Can I start a separate account for myself? Can I take a little bit of money from our joint account and can I set it aside for myself? Can I give it to a friend to give to somebody to hold for me? Can I give it to a relative? And the answer is no, 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 no. <laughs> because you'll be found out. People imagine that they won't, but they will be found out. A judge will look very dimly on that. They will know that person to be not trustworthy. And so everything else will fall down around it. And I wouldn't even expose well, myself uh, to way, that. The way I keep clients from doing that is I had a situation where somebody didn't disclose the information. And it turned out that uh, it was a $400,000 account. It was actually 700000 It gets better. $700,000 in the account. He doesn't disclose it. The wife finds out about that, reopens of the... Course case, totally. Well, meantime, this was a guy who was working on Wall Street and making huge amounts of money. The year after the divorce, he made $23 million. Yes. And all of a sudden, the case was reopened and $23 million was on the table. He, he worried about 300000 All of right. a sudden, there was... You $10 million that he ended up losing as a result of Right. That. So, so silly. And, and I had a similar case in Massachusetts. It was actually the owner of one of the very large companies. I won't say his name because it's a nationally renowned company. And uh, he was going to be bought out, and he didn't disclose that as part of the divorce. Within six months, it was bought out. And it was bought out for millions on millions on millions. And, of course, the whole divorce got reopened, and she got her fair share. So don't try it. Yeah. Just stay away from that kind of bad behavior because it'll come back at you one way or the other. But I think also people ask, is there any advantage to being the first person to file or the first person to go to an attorney or the first person to say, I want the divorce, I'm going to be the one to start the ball rolling? Do you think there's any advantage I, or disadvantage? I think that that's a, that's a good question. And interesting, the statistics, when we've done our, there's a study that we do, you can see on our website of, of that. It's historically... To, Two-thirds of the cases are women or plaintiffs, which I'm not exactly sure why, other than they may be able to tolerate the pain of the marriage as much. But I, I usually tell clients in that situation, does it make any difference? And I'll say, if in mediation, no. It's usually, a, to me, it's psychological. More often than not, the person who wants the divorce more is the plaintiff, and the person who wants the divorce less is the defendant, I found. And I usually I sort of play that game in my head, right. guessing after the initial consultation who's going to do it. On the other hand, if you are in litigation, and sometimes when you start in mediation and it ends up in litigation, there are some advantages and disadvantages because when you're trying a case, the plaintiff goes first, the defendant goes second. Right. Um, I tried a case once where uh, we were the, the plaintiff and uh, the other attorney on the other side, actually the same attorney who charged the, the $20,000 on the other oh, side. No. And he uh, said to his clients, said, was anything going to happen today? And he said, no, 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 they're going to put it in the case. Well, the first thing we did to throw people off was to call her as a witness. And it just, you know, and we had that open. control. Sure. Um, also, to some extent, I think the thing that you've got to be careful of, in some jurisdictions, the plaintiff is controlling the case so that 
if you, the plaintiff brings the case, and I had this situation once, too, where somebody was really giving us a hard time, they can withdraw the case. Mm-hmm. That's right. And so I always make sure, I always made sure I was doing that, there was a counterclaim filed so both people could do that. So if you're the plaintiff and the other side doesn't file a counterclaim, you, you can, can withdraw, withdraw the case, and right. sometimes things aren't going the way you want, and you can do it that way. So it really depends. Uh, now, in a collaborative case, I didn't think it made that much difference. Pro se, I think it's just the adversary cases which can, you know, really make the big difference that way. You're right, and in a collaborative case, it makes no difference because they're filing a joint petition. So instead of plaintiff and defendant, they're petitioner and petitioner. You can do that in Massachusetts. So. Couldn't do it in Connecticut, and you can't do it in Arizona. And yeah. I think it's a good idea. I like that because yeah. no, there is a perception of a good guy, bad guy. That's right. That's right. And I think if you do it as joint petitioners, it's a signal to the court that you've made this decision together. You've come to this agreement together. And here we are presenting ourselves as a couple to the court on equal footing. So I think it would be nice to explore more of that as an opportunity for people. Yeah, I wish people realized that they could do that because there really is that, I think, it's, for me, as I said, it's more psychological. But that's so important. The psychological hit is hugely important. And, of course, the other question people ask is, how long does it take to get a divorce? Some people are in a big hurry, and some people want to drag it out. So if you get asked that question, what do you tell them? Well, I really tell them it's up to them. I mean, I've done cases in very, within the minimum statutory time, 60 days here in Arizona, 90 days in Connecticut. I don't know what it was in Massachusetts. 90 days. 90 days, and we did it. The couple came in and were motivated to do that. Uh, and so we can get it done fairly quickly. Um, but I think the issue really... For, you know, is how long, how fast they do it. The, the real problem there I always find is that one wants to go fast, one wants to go slow. Always the case. And so or you often. try to, a lot of it when we're mediating is sort of balancing those, right. those demands. Right. And I've, I've had a couple of cases when I was litigating that, that they really went on for years, uh, sometimes for good reasons and sometimes not. Sometimes they just suspended in the middle because there were other life events that happened and sometimes because it was just cranking out the case and taking so long and getting depositions and and bringing more people in, and the facts changing, and the players changing, and oh, I could. people can they can use up years of their life doing this if they want to. Yeah, and I, although I have clients periodically I'm mediating, and I'll you know I haven't here for them a while, I'll say, "What do you?" They they start apologizing to me. Yeah, why they're doing that when uh, uh, I think one of the questions going back to that I I hear a lot of times is who it's critical issues who leaves the house right or. You know, or I'm in the house, we're in a lot of pain, what do we do? Right, and that is, that is one of the first things that happens, that people, uh, once the decision is made and they both agree that this is going to happen or they at least both know it's going to happen, how can we bear to live together in the same space? Whether you have children or not, it's terribly painful. So who has to leave the house and who stays is really initially up to them if they can reach an agreement about one person leaving even for a short period of time until they get started on their process, and then they can make a longer-term decision with the help of their professionals. I've had people separate within the house, so one person stays in the main bedroom, another one sleeps in the basement or in a mini apartment that's attached to the house or in the guest room. When you have kids, that's hard because kids ask questions. Sometimes people, if they can, they can arrange to go to a neighbor, a friend, or family member for the weekend. It's kind of like an escape valve. You know, how can I get out of here and away from the tension, at least for a few days, until we can get into a process where we can get advice? But there's no right answer. I mean, there's no statutory answer about who gets the house or who gets to stay. Often, you know, the parent who's going to be primary... Even if the house is one person's name. Even if the house is in one person's name. But often it's the person who's the primary parent who initially gets to stay so that they can create some stability for the kids. Although here in Arizona with the casitas, I guess uh, I haven't heard of a casita divorce. but uh. <laughs> Well, at least in Massachusetts it was true that our judges required the couple to be physically separated before they would grant the divorce. And so if some people were still living together in the house, even though they had separated within the household, uh, there were occasions when I know that the clients fudged that. They were waiting for the house to sell. They felt like they could stay in the house until the house sold without too much difficulty or trauma or bad behavior. Um, but the judge, the judge wouldn't allow that. They said one person had to physically get out of the house to grant the divorce. It reminds but that's you, peculiar. Uh, yeah, but it's an interesting question. I think this is one of the time bombs in divorce, which is can you uh, receive alimony and deduct it if you are living in the same house? Right. Well, and, I, and some of that has to do with the actual status of the marriage, you know, and whether you physically and legally gotten your divorce and when does alimony begin but that's a you know that's a whole nother loaded category people are 
very upset about that that concept of alimony. Um, but the other, I think, one of the other questions people ask about the house is, how do we pay the bills? Who pays the bills? Who who keeps the checkbook? You know, what do we do with the money? Especially if one person leaves and all of a sudden you're paying rent, two electric bills, two gas bills, and that's a that's an important conversation to be had. St- things can start to fall through the cracks. And your credit is at risk. So you really have to be well organized, I think, before that physical split about who's going to pay the bills and which bills are going to get paid. I, I find in the mediation, what's one thing I like about the mediation in general is that you can go through those problem-solving issues. Right. Is the problem who's going to do it? How's it been done in the past? And I also tell people this is the beginning part of you being separated. You know, That's when you start right. separating out the checking accounts, you start doing those things. I, I find more often that when that question comes up, however, it's, you know, how are we going to pay, you know, how are we going to pay for this? Who's going to, right. Whose money is it coming from? Right. And, and there isn't enough money. I mean, yeah. we find that in the collaborative process, too. It's usually one of the top things on the agenda. How will bills get paid? And the fact is, if there wasn't enough money to pay one mortgage, how is there going to be enough money to pay that plus rent? And, you know, as I said, what I usually tell the people at that point is make sure you go through every single bill and make sure who's responsible, who's going to get paid. Because sometimes they'll split up the bills. Sometimes, you know, you'll pay the electric bill. I'll pay the mortgage. You'll do that. And so we know who's responsible right. for doing that. But you're absolutely right that it's, it's, it's absolutely essential um, it, it preserves it preserves stability for the family, and the other thing which I see happening is that sometimes bills are in one spouse's name. So the Comcast bill is in her name, and the electric bill is in his name, and the water bill is in her name, and you know the gas bill is in his name. And when someone goes to rent an apartment, all of a sudden there are two gas bills in, in the same name. Companies get confused. So there's a lot of detail that has to be attended to when you start to break out a household. And sometimes people will at least try to get a, a cushion or there'll be some money that's out there so they can pull it out and use that to, to do those things. Right. But it's, it's really doing. What about, you know, we talked a little bit about money, but what about if there's a lot of arguing, name-calling, pushing, you know, you know, fairly tense situation? Yeah, but you know, I, 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 that's what do a I wonderful... Do about, I, I guess the clients, <laughs> the clients, what do I do about right, that? Right, you know? and, and it's a wonderful question because it's it's to be expected. I mean, this the, this is a tense time in a family. And there may never have been pushing or shoving or any physical contact, you know, during the marriage. And all of a sudden here at the end, someone might just get angry and push their way out of the room and brush by somebody or push them out of the way as they're leaving the room or push them up against the wall. And it may not be their typical behavior. And nevertheless, it's serious. And it's time to take a break when anything like that happens. And it's time to get professional help immediately. It's- Segues into the other questions a lot of people ask, where do I, how do I find a support group? Yeah, well, those I think they're wonderful support groups everywhere. And you probably have them on your website, and there are support groups that you can find by going on the Internet. This is one of those good places. You can usually find them in your faith community. You can find them sometimes down at the courthouse by talking to the family service officers. And there's a wonderful one in here. And I've, actually, if you go to the YouTube, you'll see it. Frank Williams does one called Divorce Recovery in, right. in Tucson, which is excellent and really helps people not only before but afterwards where they're you know very often ongoing issues right actually it's often the case we're going through the time much faster and maybe if we have time we'll do overtime but before we get too 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 last i would ask that my almost my favorite question which is probably the question that's asked more than any of the other questions that i've ever got is what are my rights yes uh, people do think about that what are my rights what am i entitled to what what's the most i can get and that's very traditional thinking and if you go to traditional attorney and you go that route then that's how the conversation is going to be framed i think if someone goes to a mediator or a collaborative attorney the it's not going to be framed that way it's going to be what are your needs what does your family really need what do you want what do you have to have during transition and then what do you have to have going forward so that your family can be secure. I mean, there are certain rights. Children have a right to be supported. That can't be compromised away. And that always takes us to the question of child support. You know, how much do we pay and and what is it for? What is child support used for? So there are some rights and there's some other rights which are more nebulous and more vague and they're really more about what do we need to have here. That's a good answer. I I think I I tend to be a little bit more saying everything's on the table, but I think you're right. The children have rights. There are certain things that are are very much defined right. uh, that in, in more often relating, relating to the children. And I think families usually have a right uh, to health care. 
you know, and there, there are rights about dividing up the property. This is a community property state, so some of this is predefined. Uh, there may be a right to alimony or to support, but it depends on the facts of the circumstances and the oh. situation. And I just heard a terrible story last night about that, a, a 20-plus year marriage, and the woman agreed to only four years of alimony. And that kind of boggles my mind that she agreed to that with, with advice of counsel. I have, I have an answer to that question, actually, because <laughs> I, well, I was early on when I was meeting, somebody said that exactly the same situation. I, I had the same reaction that you did, but I realized that she needed an emotional cut, and receiving alimony for her was continuing the relationship, and emotionally and psychologically, every time she received that check, it was like still being married, and right. she really wanted, and, and it, which is often the case. Sometimes there are financial solutions, and that's one reason we do the, some of the collaborative mediation, there are psychological right. reasons for people doing things. And, as long, and that's what I like. I think it's important that people be able to explain why right. they're doing it, right. what no. the explanation was. And once I understood that, you know, it was the money would have probably been in the long run you know, emotionally detrimental to her. Right. No, it makes sense that there has to be a rationale for why someone makes a decision. What I like about mediation and collaborative practice is it's more creative. So that person who took only four years of alimony instead of more might have gotten more of the assets. And then maybe there was income coming off the assets that substituted for longer alimony. So you can be more creative. But the money topics are tough. And people often have good questions about why do I pay, have to pay this? How long do I have to pay it? How much do I pay? I think uh, my next question, and we have about 30 seconds uh, left before I close the show. So we're going to come back on overtime and probably discuss some of these things. And about, a little bit about children, particularly the question which I'm going to ask you in overtime, you can come back and do is, you know, how do we tell the kids, which I think right. is a very, you know, a question that comes up in a lot of those. And I, I have, it's funny, as we, we put the questions together, and I always, you know, it takes a lot longer. But I think it's probably evident of why you need to talk. This is not a simple process. Right. In doing that, you really need to take the time in doing that. But Rita, thank you very much. It's uh, okay. always a pleasure. And I think part of it I like is because we sort of, you know, we, you know, we know, sometimes what we do is can be a slightly lonely situation. So it's good to really exchange right. things with a, a colleague to know uh, what's going on and not going on. But uh, you've been watching Divorce, Divorce TV uh, with your host, Wally Marcus, and my very special guest, Rita Pollack. And uh, we are going to be going into overtime, which is going to be only on YouTube. So we'll be answering more questions. I got this from John Stewart and from uh, that one. But thank you very much, Rita. And uh, my enjoy talking to you more on overtime. Thank you.
Part of our uh, discussion with Rita Pollack, um, who's my good friend uh, from, was from Boston, I want to say from Boston, but uh, now of Tucson, Tucson, and we were talking about divorce frequently asked questions and did a lot, half hour, which is the first part of this. Now we're following up with some things that we didn't get a chance to do for about five, ten minutes, because right. we all have things to do tonight. Um, Rita, we were talking, I guess the last question is how do you tell, we were talking about was potentially, how do you, maybe the, the toughest question, right. how do you tell the kids? How do you tell the kids? And at what point do you tell them and what do you tell them? And that's really a heart-wrenching question. And of course, the professional advice that we hear from everybody in the psychological community is that you tell them together. If you can possibly do that, that the husband and wife sit down together with the children and you have to prepare carefully for this because it can be very emotional. You try very hard not to show any anger. You're almost getting teary-eyed <laughs> talking about the question. <laughs> not, you know, not to show anger towards, towards your partner. Uh, and explain to them that whatever has happened means that you're not going to be living together anymore, you're not going to be married together anymore, and you will always love them and take care of them. I mean, children just want to be reassured. And at least from what I've heard from my clients is that the kids don't even fully absorb it right away. What they're concerned about is where will they live, who will take care of them, what about their friends? Will they have to leave school? They're, they get very concerned about themselves, um, and then they get scared. And so you usually have to have that conversation, I think, more than once. And I don't think you overload kids. I think you tell them just a little bit, depending on their age. There are lots of good books about how to do this so that you can really tie it right into their age and stage of development so that the kids can really understand. And sometimes I think you need professional help in telling kids this is, about we haven't this. Dis we haven't discussed this extensively. We've talked a little bit about it, but I'm always amazed that you know, the other thing about doing this is that how you and I are usually on the same page right. uh, on these things independently of uh, that. But I guess that's where all of my, my anecdote on that one was, I'm not even sure where this came from, is the child, the parents went through the whole thing and the, the kids said to the, the parents, can I bring my teddy bear with me? And they said yes, and then okay. <laughs> And it's, it probably seemed like it was over, but my guess is that a couple of days later that child had some more questions. And those questions keep coming up over and over again as the, as the reality s sets yeah, in. I think in the, the, you really you got to be a situation where I always tell people, don't set up a situation where you can divide and conquer here. Right. You're empowering the kids in a way that they have to know that you're divorcing each other, not the kids. Right. And that uh, there really is not going to be a... Right, that they still have mom and dad, that they can still go to mom and dad. And I know that's terribly hard, and maybe we're being unrealistic, but this is frequently asked questions, and it's one of the questions, and it's one of our opportunities, I think, to give people good advice, that, that you really set up a stage where the kids play off against each other, and it's, it's setting the kids up for a very bad outcome. And I think, strangely enough, I think this is one of, the, one of those areas where I think there's a huge difference between adversary divorce and, and mediated and collaborative. And I, I always feel that, it, for me, in the mediation, it's an educational process, it's a growth parent. You can talk to both of them and, and, and do that, and it doesn't become so toxic that the kids right. get hurt in the process. And I, you know, I always often tell people, if you can't have a good marriage, at least have a good divorce. That's right. And so I think that you can you can do that very often in mediation and and, 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 and collaborative. And, and there's collaborative. a book called the, the Good Divorce by Connie yeah. Ahrens. But there's also a question that we hear is about how much do we tell the kids, how much detail. And and kids really don't need to know about your personal life. This is not the time to make your kid your confidant or your best friend and to give them all the details about what the SOB did wrong and he came in late or he was drunk or he has someone else or she didn't do this or I've never loved your mother anyway. These are not the stories to be telling your kids because it's their legacy. <laughs> you know, it's their legacy. It's what they'll remember most about their, oh, their childhood and, I, I and tell their people, family. One of the lines that I, I love in this situation, and it's sort of the variation on it, is be careful with your kids because they're going to choose what nursing home you go into. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that this is a little bit of this case, too, because I, I see that, you know, it's, it was the cat's cradle. You know, I'm going to be just like you, right. Dad. That's right. I, I think that that uh, one of the things uh, that is a problem here is that you're, the kids are going to come. This is going to come back to bite you later on. It will come back. It, it will just create instability and lack of security for the kids. And that's not what we want. And I'm, I try to counsel my clients that as much as possible, the kids' lives should look as if the parents never got divorced. So... 
if they went to soccer and if they went to piano and if they went to the babysitter. You try to keep all those things the same for them. And you do have to tell other people in your social circle. You have to tell the teachers. So in case there are some changes in behavior, the teachers know. I think you tell the pediatrician. I think you tell coaches. And they don't need the details either. I mean, I've had clients who've come storming onto the soccer field, you know, screaming about the girlfriend being there or the boyfriend being there and causing huge public embarrassing scenes. Kids don't need that. Well, the variation on this question I think is always funny, and I've gotten this quite often, is he never went to the baseball games or the soccer games before, and now he's there all the time. That's right, and that's <laughs> Why? probably true. He's there all the time because now he realizes how precious his time is with the kids, and he probably has them for the game, so he's bringing them. He's, he's finally finding his way into the kids' lives. He's getting to know the coaches and the other parents, and there he is. I know it's very annoying. I, I know this. It's true. Um, but I think the, the more private you keep this and the less detail you put out there in the public, the better it's going to be for the kids. Then they don't hear things from other kids. They don't overhear things. You don't want them to overhear phone conversations you're having late at night. You're calling your best friend and you're complaining, and you don't realize the kid has gotten out of bed and is you know, also, sneaking I, in the doorway, I, listening. I think one of the things that we're sort of saying in that, too, which, once again, I always love these things pop in my head, but the Internet provides another situation where kids all of a sudden start accessing their parents' internet, their emails, yes. that they're all of a sudden they go on and they're seeing that their parents are on a, a dating site or something like that. Yes. So I think, you know, we sort of talk about what you do in front of the kids, but the kids have to be, and, and I, our divorce mediation notebook doesn't have any names on it. I think you, you, there's a, right. and we've often sent out mail to people that says CDM instead of Center for Divorce Mediation. Oh, absolutely. So that, you know, that there's... You keep it private. private. And, and you've already alluded to the next question, which is, you know, when can I date? People ask that question. When can I start dating? When can I introduce my dates to my kids? And um, Depends if you... <laughs> According to some of the spouses, never. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and so those questions are really delicate questions. And while they make good sense, I think people take, need to take more thought and care. They might, they might get some professional advice. They might talk about that in mediation or with their collaborative attorney. I, I tell people that you really have to be discreet. Right. Um, on that situation, I do that, which leads me, and once again, we don't have a lot of time. I'll try to tell the story quickly. A couple started asking me that question once. When can I start dating? I said, be discreet, you know, so you're not in each other's faces. Because a lot of times they see, you know, each other with somebody else, they become jealous and it becomes, uh, it right. aggravates the process. Right. Um, and I tell people to, to hold off. So I told this couple, please, to be discreet. And they came into the next mediation session sort of both giggling, which is, happens occasionally. And why, why are you giggling? And we, was, we were being discreet. So we were in Connecticut at that point, And we decided we'd go to New York where we wouldn't be seen. And we decided to have dinner. And it turned out that they both ended up going to the same restaurant at the same time and had tables next Yikes. to each other. So, so much Yikes. for being discreet. Yikes. At least they were discreet around the kids. Yeah. Yikes. But that's like a similar story where, the, where each spouse goes on a dating site and they start to put in their information and they disguise a few <laughs> things about each other. And, they, and then they go meet in a coffee shop and it turns out to be... I haven't be, heard that one before. But it turns it, out that they're it's meeting each very other. good. So. Um, what are the one I get a lot of questions too is, you know, I don't want the divorce... And particularly the, the corollary question, I don't want the divorce, and why should I have to pay alimony right. if I don't want the divorce? Right, and it's a great question, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, I mean, it's sad that you don't want the divorce, um, but you're going to get divorced. The other person has a right to divorce you. And paying alimony has nothing to do with who wants it and who doesn't want it. It really is a statutory kind of thing. There are guidelines about, about divorce and about alimony and when it gets paid, how much it gets paid, and how long it gets paid for. So there's no connection. I know in your heart there's a connection, um, but there really is no connection. So. Okay, Rita, we could probably do this all day <laughs> long and, uh, and doing that one, but uh, we, maybe we'll do another one, but we are running out of, uh, out of time today. So once again, okay. thank you for the second time today. It's You're always welcome. fun. We'll, we'll talk in the car back, uh, answer some more of these questions, but you've been watching a Divorce TV Overtime with Wally Marcus and with Rita Pollack, and we hope you enjoy it. Once again, if you have any questions or would like to appear on the show or anything, that we'd always like some feedback from you, you know, we welcome that. Uh, so please uh, email us or check out the website so you can hear more from you. And once again, thanks for watching us, and thank you, Rita. Thank you, Wally.